Hello everybody, welcome back. Our next speaker is Jennifer Rantolo. She's a registered nurse. She is the owner of Butterfly Family Wellness. And she marries the concepts of intuitiveness and science and that just blows the medical community out of the water. She helps stressed out parents tame the chaos and she is a firecracker. We love her. And I just, without further ado, here's Jennifer. Well, we have to tell you, you are in for a treat as you talk with Jennifer and you see her smile and you, and you hear her words, you feel her passion. Uh, this is going to be something you really need to hear. And so, Jennifer, welcome. We're so glad that you are here. So grateful to you. Now, Thank you so much. Oh, you are very welcome. Now, one of the things that we know as we've gotten to know you over the course of the past couple of months is that your story, your life, has been this balance and almost transition of moving science, blending it with intuition. Can you tell us what brought you to that reckoning of science and intuition, which most people would sit and say, no way those two don't go together. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, for me, I would say, and I, I will preface this by saying, I think everybody comes into the world with your third eye or your place of internal knowing and connection um, wide open. And it's society conditioning us as we grow and get older to start to doubt, question, um, and mistrust that information. And a lot of it has to do with societal demands. A lot of it has to do with pleasing others, whatever it is. I was one of those people that came in with, um, you know, some intuitive gifts and it scared my mother who was Southern Baptist raised. She didn't understand it. And what we don't understand, we can often be fearful of. So I remember sort of um, saying things and my mother would say, oh, stop it. You're just trying to get attention or you know, I would question adults often because I would have truth um, that I would know inside and it wouldn't align with what I was seeing, what I was seeing or being told. Um, and, um, you know, nowadays we would call that a willful child or a, um, you know, I mean, there are a lot of a lot of children out there who are internally curious and who maybe know something that we can't explain or we don't trust anyway. So moving ahead, I quickly learned that it was important for me to understand logic and use logic and science to back up the hunches or the feelings or the things that I would know, but couldn't necessarily explain. So I learned I had to use science and logic to explain things. So I went into, I've always been a nurturer. I went into nursing uh, and have always again, had that hunch, but now I knew the medical stuff and the science behind the hunches. And before I would say anything, I would make sure I had all my data to back it up. Um, uh, it was also kind of, a I, I like to be in control of things, a bit type A, more than a bit type A. I was very type A. Anyhow, so fast forward, um, I'm a critical care nurse. I am getting a master's in, in nursing administration, thinking I'm gonna change healthcare that way. I have my first child, everything's going along great. I have my second child. And I remember waking up after my C-section, wondering, where's my baby? And all the babies around me are crying and they won't let me hold my baby. And turns out my son had a massive neonatal stroke at birth. And here's where it was almost like the universe shut off my left logical brain because I could not wrap my head around what was going on. I couldn't understand why won't they let me hold my baby? Why is my baby being sent off 30 miles away to a hospital in Boston while I'm in the community hospital? I just wanna hold my baby. I'm supposed to hold my baby. This isn't how it was with my first child. And I remember just feeling so overwhelmed and just this fogginess. Now, again, I was a critical care nurse. Like I know, I know 
worst case scenarios. I know the bad stuff that happens, but my brain wouldn't go there. And all of a sudden I got this very clear message to just breathe, just take deep breaths. And it was like, I took these nice deep breaths and this fog lifted. And all of a sudden this clarity came that was, you just need to be with your son. You just need to connect to your son. He will let you know what he needs. And I remember arriving at the hospital. My husband was there with my son. My parents were watching my other son. And I remember arriving at the hospital and my husband, who's a, a surgeon, is laboring over neonatal intensive care books. And I remember looking at him and saying, babe, we don't need to worry about that. We just need to connect to my son, our son and he'll let us know what he needs. And I remember just whole, finally getting to a place where I could hold him, hearing all the people talking and feeling in my gut this very contracted feeling like, no, this isn't right. This isn't right. And I remember finally saying like, excuse me, we have him so like, when can I feed him? When is he going to wake up? Because you have him on so much medication. And these doctors are telling me this. And these doctors are saying this. But they're conflicting. So what's the answer? What's the truth? And that's when I really started to find that truth inside of me. And those answers and what needed to be done started to come. And I started to have the courage to say, nope, can we do this? This is what I want. This is what I think we need. Can we just try this and see what happens? So this is also when my dear friend, Bonnie, who had been trying to train me in Reiki said to me, honey, I really think he's going to need Reiki. So let me train you. And before when I was like, mm, okay, that might be good for you. I'm good. There's nothing I wouldn't try for my children. So I became, I went and got trained. She attuned me to Reiki and I fast tracked and got, became a Reiki master. Um, I learned everything I could about the brain and science. Like I wanted to understand the science. I wanted to have the knowledge for me, but I also needed it so I could really tune into what is it that I can do to feel empowered with what can I do and then be guided towards, okay, here's what you need to understand. Here's what you need to learn. I became a personal trainer because my son didn't move the right side of his body. So I needed to understand how to get him to move and what, what kind of movement stuff was gonna be important for him. Um, and then fast forward, the, um, that was really, that was my first awakening, I would say, my awakening to my intuition. That's when I learned how to communicate with the angels. That's, I remember walking into the same mother who told me I was just trying to get attention. I remember walking into her house and there was a book on how to communicate with the angels. And I thought, why do you have this book? And she goes, I don't know. I was just in a store and I saw it. I just picked it up. And I was like, well, that was for me. And she goes, must be. And so I started to just dabble in journaling and really fully opening to that intuition, recognizing that when I open to that intuition and use that intuition along with my logical brain and the science, that's where I was the most powerful. That's where I truly um, just got what needed to be done. You know, not, not from an overly emotional place, but from an informed, logical and intuitive place, a balanced and grounded place, if you will. Then fast forward a couple of years later, my third son, same day I found out I was having my fourth boy, my third son was diagnosed with leukemia. Now, again, my logical nurse's brain could not wrap around what was going on. I remember going into the pediatrician's office with him. He had some bruising. His belly was a little distended. He was complaining of some belly pain. He was about two and a half. And I remember she palpated his liver and she went, oh, honey, I'm sorry. Oh, his liver's distended. And I thought, okay, so what do we need? An ultrasound? And she's looking at me like, again, assuming I knew what she was talking about, but my mother's brain wouldn't go there. Now, I remember being in the hospital with my second son, seeing all the bald kids thinking, well, you know, okay, my son had the stroke and we've got some neurological stuff, but at least I don't have to deal with that. Thinking that I couldn't handle a son with cancer. Then fast forward a couple of years later, and here I am. And I remember them, finally, I remember having to say to them, excuse me, 
can somebody just tell me what we're talking about? What is it that he's got? And they were like, Jen, he's got leukemia. And I was like, oh my God, okay. Now, I remember them handing me this book about, uh, oh, probably like almost 12 inches thick, this big binder, like here's the next two years of your life. Now I'm pregnant and I have two children at home. And I remember everybody wanted to help me and I was not great about letting people help me. That was one of my lessons, which I'm sure we'll get into later. But um, I remember thinking, okay, I'm going to call this person that I know because I know she's she, she went through cancer with her child and she had kids at home. I want to know how am I going to do this with kids at home? How do I make it okay for everybody? And then I'm going to call this person because she's a nurse practitioner with the Jimmy Fund and she's going to tell me, she's going to give me hope here. Everybody else, I don't want to hear it. Like, I don't need the sadness. I need positivity. I need, anyway, I had all the tools that I needed to get through this. I had the intuition. I had the, um, the connection to, um, to the soul connection to my children. I had at this point, the trust of my husband and my family who had seen my intuition and my gifts at work with my other son. Um, I had the, tr the, um, the ability at this point to connect to my guides and the angels. Um, so all of this really saved me and helped me navigate through all of this. I had the Reiki. So I did Reiki on my son every single day. And I remember teaching the nurses at the bedside how to do Reiki when I'm not there. And it was just a very, it was like, it was like a, a, another awakening. And I've actually had uh, my friend Bonnie and, an, and another uh, good friend of mine say to me, this was your soul contract with your son. He was going to go through this so you can awaken fully to your gifts and you were going to help him heal. And now it really fast forward, I got to the point where I was so busy in that warrior mom mode, helping everybody else that my own health started to suffer because I wasn't putting myself on the map. I was taking care of everybody and I was um, not taking care of myself. So I, I really learned through all of that, that I really needed to take that pause and connect to myself and understand what I needed. Because if I didn't take care of myself and I didn't learn to ground myself, instead of seeing fires everywhere or battles everywhere when there weren't any, I would not be around to help my children. I would not be as powerful as I could be if I was caught in that stress spin, just serve, and I was in survival mode. I needed to get to thriving so I could help my children thrive. So, now this is what I do. I help teach people um, how to connect to their messages of their mind, body, and spirit. I help educators and I help um, healthcare professionals understand how they can be their most powerful selves by understanding the science, but also opening to the intuition and finding that balance between the two, because that's where we, we are our most powerful. Tons of uh, <laughs> lessons that you learned along the way. What we also know now is that you not only learned these lessons in that time period, but you now live your life in that direction. Like you just said, you teach other people, you train, you coach. So if you could go back and say, what were the biggest lessons that really you learned that made the shift in the way that you live your life today? What would you share with the women of the world who are hearing your story and, and, and thinking what you thought? I couldn't do that. I couldn't do that. But you did it and you're proof mm -hmm. for everybody who's listening who thinks that they can't. Mm -hmm. But what are the golden nuggets of lessons that you can share with them so that they can believe and trust that they can do whatever they need to do, whatever the situation is. The situation might be different, but whatever the situation is that balance, how it has affected how you live on a daily basis, how can it affect them? Yes, yes, those are, I learned actually a bunch of uh, key nuggets, I would say, but number one, one of the first things that I had to learn was to allow people to help me, that it doesn't make me weak, because I was raised to be very self-sufficient, very independent, 
and raised to be a powerful woman by trying to be more like a man and being able to survive in the man's world and not need anybody. So I really had to decondition myself and allow other people to help me, realizing that when I open myself up and allow other people to help me, I am able to be stronger and more powerful and more purposeful. And that allowing others to help me doesn't weaken me. It actually, it, it, it helps to build that community. And that just as much as I, I am the first one to show up and help others. And I remember my dear friend saying to me, Jen, why are you denying people that feeling of helping you when they know they can't take on your burden, but if they can help you and lighten the other burdens for you, why are you robbing them of that? And it was absolutely true. And so it really took me the second go around with my second, the third son to really fully allow other people to, op- to help me and to surrender that I don't have to do it all by myself. I don't have to have all the answers that when I open to guidance and when I say, I, I need help here, I'm having a really hard time right now. It doesn't mean that I'm weak. It means that I'm human and that I need like the kayak on my long-term swim, right? I need, I need to just take a rest, take a pause so I can reset, regroup and get back at it. That was one. Second thing I learned was really that I have everything I need inside of myself, that I don't need to look to other people to tell me what the right thing to do is or to give me the blueprint for my life, or to tell me who my children are, or tell me who I am. I need to just stop and listen to that internal knowing and trust that I have everything in me, that no matter what life throws my way, I can handle it. Probably not alone, but I can handle whatever comes my way. And then number three is really that Every, I truly believe that everything happens to us, that everything that happens to us in life is an opportunity for us to learn and grow. That we need, that I need to not think of something as being done to me, but it's being done for me. It's like an opportunity to rise. And so when I open to the magic of the message of the challenge, that's where I can truly tap into my power. That's when I can truly emerge and grow and be better and do better. And like, almost like climbing that mountain, get to the next level. But when we're stuck in that victimhood, we can't move. We can't, we, we, we sort of can't seem to rise where our victimhood is what keeps us down. So just opening to that, those possibilities of a pivot or um, a lesson or um, an opportunity. That's, those were like the big aha moments for me that I encourage anybody in the face of challenge to really just pause and think, okay, what is the message in this? What could be the bigger, the bigger message for me here? What am I meant to learn in this situation? That's, that's amazing. Thank you so much. That's so helpful. So many people need to hear this message. So thank you. So let's talk about what you mean by taming the chaos. I love talking about taming the chaos. So life is chaotic, okay? Hello, mother of four boys. I'm a doer. I literally will be sitting on my couch sometimes trying to read a book with balls flying all around me. And my mother will look at me and say, how can you read a book? Like, what? And here's what I've learned. I cannot control anything outside of me. There is chaos all around us, but with every storm, there is an eye of the storm that is calm. We need to find that eye of the storm within ourselves. So taming the chaos really begins with taming the chaos of our thoughts, taming the chaos of our nervous system and our triggered conditioned response to things, taming the chaos of our body's reaction to to something that we might perceive as danger. Um, And then really learning how to calm our nervous system, calm our mind, question 
those thoughts and the conditioned response in our mind and the story that plays on repeat in our mind, learning how to calm that. And then we can start to really take back control over our health and our happiness. So many moms, so many clients of mine will say, I just want peace. I just want moments of peace. And I'll say like, nobody's going to create a a moment of peace for you. That's something that you need to create for yourself. And it all starts within you. And if you're looking for peace in the world, that starts by peace within self. When people are fe- are peaceful within themselves, and when they have learned to sort of not get, I, it, it's like it's like a tornado, right? The chaos is a tornado, and that tornado spins, and anything in its wake gets picked up into that spin and tornado. But when you are grounded and rooted and take shelter, or when you find your the eye of the storm you no longer get caught up in that spin. You're able to kind of ground and anchor yourself and say, okay, what's going on here? Like the world is maybe going crazy right now, but what can, what do I have control of in this moment? Me, myself, my actions, my thoughts, my choices, my reactions, one moment at a time. And by doing that, all of a sudden you start to ripple that calm starts within and you start to ripple that calm outside to, to your family as a mom, when I'm all caught up in that spin, guess who else gets caught up in that spin? My children. But when I learn how to calm myself and, and um, anchor myself and reset my nervous system, all of a sudden my kids are calmer. My kids learn how to reset their nervous system. My kids don't get caught up in that spin. And then they take that to their friends and then they take that to school and so on. And so on. It's like that pert commercial, you know, the hair and the I, she tells two pert people and I did and so on and so on. That's the taming the chaos and rippling that calm. So Jen, let's say that you right now are uh, watching the tornado and you're, you feel like you're just getting sucked into it. What is the one thing that you would do right now that you could teach women to, to get that centered? Is there like a, Breathing yes. technique, what would you yes. do right now? So uh, actually, I, I, I love that you asked this. Everybody gets triggered. And I think one of, the, one of the falsehoods is to think that, okay, I have these tools, therefore I never get caught in the spin. I get caught in the spin and I've been doing this. I teach people how to, how to pause, right? I teach people how to stop spinning. The first thing to do is to recognize, oop, I'm starting to spin here. By, by recognizing that you're starting to get nervous, anxious. I was a kid, I had panic attacks. That's a spin, right? I remember recently, and I'll give this example, that way I can take you through it. I was on a plane. I was on a plane accident when I was in college. I was literally like not paying attention when they were going through the emergency review, you know, like this is what to do in emergency. And all of a sudden, it was an emergency. The wing was on fire and we were landing in a field and I was in an emergency exit. Oopsie. Yeah. So needless to say, I don't love flying anymore, but I know I have to fly for different things. Right. So I was going to an event. I was speaking at this event and I get on the plane. I'm going away from my family. And all of a sudden I can feel myself start to spin. So what does that feel like? Heart rate starts to pound. I start to get clammy. I start to find myself a little restless. I start to have these thoughts creep into my my mind about like catastrophic thinking, it's called. I start to think like, well, what if this and what if this and that? And then the spin starts. So the first thing to do is to say, okay, I'm spinning. So take five slow, deep breaths. So I'm sitting on the plane. I'm taking a couple of deep breaths and I'm tuning into my body as I'm taking those deep breaths and I'm, I'm noticing the areas that are tense. So now I need to embody my, so our thoughts, we can spin up here. Now I need to anchor my thoughts by anchoring into my body and I'm tuning in and I, you tune into your body and you notice those areas of tension and you breathe into those areas and you start to slowly relax. And then once you have your body relaxed and you've reset your nervous system with the breath, it's called the relaxation response, where you go from fight or flight to now you're in that parasympathetic relaxed. And then you can start to tune into those thoughts in your mind and question those thoughts. What is it that I'm thinking? What is it that is spinning me? Is it true? 
why might I be thinking this? And then you start to slowly take control of those thoughts by questioning it and by recognizing those are not true thoughts. Those are conditioned responses. I'm not going to get in a plane crash. And, I, and then I think, okay, well, if I'm worried about that, what can I do? I say a prayer and I ask the angels. For me, it's the angels. I ask Archangel Michael to, to safely get me from point A to point B. And I breathe and I realize, you know what? It's just your nerves. When you start to, you know, if you hit turbulence, just breathe through it. You know, so you start to kind of go through those what if scenarios. What am I worried about? Okay, what's my plan? So you, that's where you balance the logic, the knowing, okay, this is what I know I can do to take it back control of my body. And then the intuition by surrendering and asking for help and guidance and by like just knowing in my gut, I got a whole lot more to do. It's not my time. And I need to trust that, right? So that's, and, and there are little moments, same thing with my kids. I'll get spun up by something that my kids do. And I have to just, it's the pause. It is the pause, the reset, and then the connection to yourself, to your mind, to your body, and to your spirit. That's where the magic happens. That's where you take back your power. That's where you calm the chaos. So pause. Reset. Reset and reconnect. Yes. Pause, reset, reconnect. You know, it's interesting. If, if we were to just close our eyes and say those three words, pause, reset, reconnect, it almost does that anchoring. Yep. Just in thinking about the process. So thank you for sharing that with us. Oh, absolutely. Another thing people can do too is start far as anchoring. Sometimes when we're spinning, I, I'm an energy worker. So sometimes when we're spinning, it's because we're overthinking and our energy is way up here. And we get caught in that logical brain, the overthinking brain, which creates this spin. So sometimes what we need to do is just breathe and anchor our energy. So whether it's sitting in a chair or standing, planting your feet on the ground, really feeling the ground beneath your feet and picturing, I love to do a tree meditation where I picture my feet like the roots and ground that energy and really like feel the steadiness of your body as it connects to the earth and then taking a deep breath, I like to raise my hands up and I just kind of feel that energy shoot up and connect to the sky. So you're connecting earth and sky. It's a beautiful way to just ground and anchor and center the energy. That's beautiful. I want to say that a lot of women aren't in the place of really self love or trusting themselves. Oh, yeah. I feel like this is, you need to trust yourself. How did you get to the point where you could trust the voices and, you know, know what is what and, and get to that place of self-trust? Yeah. You know, that that's an awesome question. And, and there are still moments now that I don't trust myself, that I doubt myself. That's just, that's inherent, I think. That is our ego that sort of questions things and creates this mistrust. And that's one of the biggest things, I think, that blocks our intuition and blocks our magic is that mistrust, that questioning things. Um, I actually just wrote about this in, um, in a blog about the one moment that was like an aha moment for me that taught me to really trust that I do have a gift and that I am getting messages. So um, I'll try to be brief with this, but my son uh, that had leukemia, he uh, wound up ha getting basically almost dying. He had this thing called press syndrome, which is basically the swelling in the brain that happens from the high dose chemotherapy that he was getting. He had some swelling in his brain. And I remember we had taken him home for just a couple of days and he was in his room and he was calling me. And I remember him going, mommy, mommy, mommy. And I went up to his room. I'm like, I'm right here, baby. What's up? And it was like, he was not connecting. He, he didn't see me. He didn't hear me. It was literally like his soul had left his body and it, it scared me. And my husband and I just automatically called the cancer center and we're like, we, we're bringing him in. Uh, thought, you know, we, the normal person probably would have called 911, but we were like, you know, we're going to just bring him in. He's a doctor. I'm a nurse. We got this. But driving in, I called my friend Bonnie and I remember saying like, I don't know what's going on but this is what's happening. Are you getting a, can you get a read on what's happening energetically? And I remember her saying to me, um, 
call all the angels, ask the angels to be with him and ask all the angels to be with any hand that touches him. I said, I already did that. And she said, okay, Michael, another friend of ours, we're in this Reiki thing right now. We're going to tune into him and I'll, I'll get back to you. And I remember getting to the hospital, all the doctors are around him and Michael calls me, he said, Jen, I'm so sorry, honey, but I can't see the baby. I was like, what do you mean you can't see the baby? And he said, there are so many angels around him. I can't see the baby. And I said, okay, okay. They're there because I asked them to be there. Why are you sorry? He said, because the only time I see this many angels is when they've come to take him. And so my husband is hearing this conversation and we get to the hospital and he says, you go sit in the corner right now, because sometimes when it's something very personal to me, I am not as clear audience. I don't hear it. I have to journal and I'll get a message that way. So he said, go sit in the corner and journal and ask if they are here to take him. And I said, I know, like, I just know in my gut, they're not here to take him. They're here because I've asked them to be here. So I sat in the corner and I asked, are you here to take him or are you here because I've asked you to be here? And they said, we are here because you've asked us to be. Your son has chosen to stay. His soul has chosen to stay. And I remember telling my husband that and my husband just gave me a big hug and said, thank God. And I thought, if he can trust me, why can't I? And it was like that to me, it's funny because my husband just read this and he said, I didn't realize that was such a pivotal moment for you. And I said, for you, my logical, scientific, you know, data surgeon husband can trust me so implicitly, why can't I? And so I, I, through the years, I'll have things, you know, where I'm channeling something or where I just get that gut feeling and I've, I've learned to play with it and just say, well, let's just see where this goes. I remember my husband and I walking someplace with the kids and he said, should we go left or right? I go, what does your gut say? And he's like, you know what? My gut's telling me to go right. And I said, so was mine. So it was like a validation, right? And then we go and we wind up where we're supposed to be. So it's just this sort of trial and error. And the more you just go with it and the more you, maybe you have that gut instinct, you say, okay, I'm just going to listen to that. Or you get this message. I'm just going to listen to that. I had a client the other day tell me she got a message from uh, her, her spouse's mother who had passed. She said, all of a sudden I started getting these pictures and started to get this message. So I just wrote it down. And then I, I didn't really understand it, but I just, I told my husband, he was like, oh my God. And she goes, I don't know what made me do that. That's, that's just trusting and just kind of, even when you get like a hunch, I like to use things too, to verify because I've, I've learned to do that again. That's the logical brain needing that logic. So I'll use something like a pendulum, which is, uh, I'll show you a pendulum is just something that's like a, a, a stone on the end. And I'll ask a yes or no question. I'll use that. I learned how to muscle test um, to verify some of my medical intuition and my hunches that way. So there's a lot of different ways that I still look to validate and verify my truth, but your body will let you know. You can get this. When I know that something is right, I sometimes get a full body tingle or I just feel like light and if something feels wrong or, or, or if I'm questioning something, I'll get like a contracted feeling. I do have a, um, a, a whole, how do you tune into your own truth um, freebie, I believe that you guys are, are putting out there that people can get. And I do go through this kind of stuff, but it's really just trial and error. And the more you you trust and just just take a, take a chance on trusting the more then it gets, it's verified that yes, that was the right thing to do for you. And then the more you start to trust and it becomes easier and easier and easier. But, you know, it's normal to have the self-doubt. It's normal to, to question because that's how we've been conditioned to be. So it's just recognizing that, having that awareness. And then, you know, I like to just sort of take a risk if there's not, you know, depending on the risk of a situation, trust, just see what happens. It's wonderful to hear that from you as I'm sure there are women all over the world that are sitting there and saying, no way you're a nurse and listen to how you're talking. <laughs> and that's the whole point is that it doesn't matter who we are or what role we take in life or the career that we're in. We have innate abilities. Absolutely. 
And you've proven that to us by marrying the science and the intuition. And it, it almost sounds like you live more by the intuitive side. I would say it's a true balance, but I have learned to let my intuition and that magic guide me because that's where my inner truth is. Logic gives me information to sort of make informed choices, but it's really that intuition that's going to tell me what's right for me, where my truth is. So it's really both. I think you really do need both. And, and um, I mean, it, it, there are times where I get too my, like there are still times where I'm too much left brain, which is that logical brain. And I have to remind myself to open a little bit there, you know, to, to that. But that again, that's, that's conditioning. And that's, um, you know, all of us know where our sweet spot is and it's just knowing who you are and what you need. And for me, I do need the logic. I do need that grounding energy, but I also need that intuition, right? But I'm not, uh, and I think that the work that I do, it's easier for people in science to receive what I have to say because I do bridge that gap. Whereas if I were somebody that were very much intuitive or woo woo or using a lot of things that I couldn't explain um, or, or give some grounding or some facts or some science to, it's going to be harder to get them to understand and follow me on that path. And so it depends on who you're working with. But for me, that's my, that's my wheelhouse for me to get other people to understand. I mean, I, I remember working with uh, when I was doing one-on-one stuff and I, when I do muscle testing, I remember working with a doctor who would, um, he would have somebody, uh, he, he would have somebody touch the patient and he would muscle test his person. And I thought, well, then that person's not feeling it. Then they don't know what that feels like to have, you know, a positive or a negative response. So for me, I spend more time going over the the body and how to muscle test and what a locked and an unlocked muscle feels. Because for me, a person needs to feel that sensation to really understand what their truth is. They need to feel what that feels like. So for, so for me, I probably go too much into the logic and explain things, but it's important to me because for me, that's what clicks for me. So I, that's my truth. And that's how I choose to put that forward. Does that make sense? Yes, it does make sense. And it puts it in, into perspective for us. And, and thank you for clarifying that that is the, the balance. As I also hear you talk, it's also your gift. Thank you. Because you have the wherewithal to be the nurse that you are, and you have the wherewithal to be the intuitive that you are. And you're changing people's lives. You're changing doctors' and nurses' lives. You're changing patients' lives. You're changing your children's lives lives with the balance of that all. And so it's not, I I want all the women in the world to hear this. We all have this innate ability. And when you marry it with who you are, on the outside and marry the inside, then you show up as this 100% beautiful gift to the world. And that's oh. you that we're looking at right now. So. Oh, oh. shucks. Thanks, yeah. Teresa. I mean, I feel like, you know what the, it, it's really understanding the magic of the, whatever it is you're struggling with, whatever challenge you're being faced, I truly believe it's a, there's a reason for it. And when we open to that, that's when we really can, find that balance and find that truth and find what works for us. And then we can authentically move through our lives with integrity and with balance. And that's the thing there's, I don't, I mean, I walk my walk. I will tell people, if you go to a practitioner or you go talk, you go to see somebody that doesn't walk their walk, that tells you what to do, but really is never, what does Brene Brown say? Something about like, if you're not in the arena with me, if you've never been in the arena with me, I don't want to hear it. I have been in the arena and you know what? I only go to people that have also been in the arena and that trust my voice that no, I know me better than you know me. So if I tell you that something's a little bit off, listen to what I'm saying. If you blow me off, I will not go see you anymore. We're done. That's knowing yourself and standing up using your voice. Hello, high five. 
That's a lesson we all need to, to hear with that amount of strength and conviction and positivity in it all. So thank you for that. Yes.